There's a couple of things that God has been kind of putting in my spirit and, and things He's been showing me. One up besides uh, the teaching we're going to do this morning, I'm resurrecting Biblical Life Mentors Tips. And that's something that we mailed out in times past that really helped people just turn a lot of things around. And uh, I've already got 12 articles in my heart. Uh, that's going to be a blending. This, this you know, we, we've talked about a lot of things that are going to happen in 2013 and how that uh, 2013 is also going to be the year of false light. And just as soon as I release that video, I'm starting to hear from all across the body of Christ. I mean, crazy things, you know, from Baptist churches teaching that God can sin. What in the world is that doing in a Baptist church? To Pentecostal churches, everything's now about feeling, not about the Word. So if the Word says one thing, but I feel another, what does that open you up for? Feel another. Uh, I mean, just crazy, crazy stuff. I think one of the ones that disturbs me the most, and uh, I had to go to some of their websites and Facebook pages to verify this, one of the, uh, the groups that are major on teaching oneness are now teaching that Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, is a pagan God and an evil God. And they're using uh, writings from Kabbalah to prove that Judaism and everything in the Old Testament is pagan. Of course, how many know their stuff is real shallow to begin with? But they, they, have become, they, have, they have swallowed Marcionism, hook, line, and sinker, that Marcion later on taught that Jesus conquered Yahweh. And how many know that ain't right? I mean, turn to your name and say, that ain't right. And if you start following another Jesus that is not Yahweh Elohim come in the flesh, it is another Jesus. And if you're looking to him for salvation, you're not saved. And I mean, it's, it's this a good portion of the body where they have allowed deception to come in, self-deception. <laughs> they're, they're on a greasy slope. They're like Teflon with KY jelly on the bottom of their feet. And they're... <laughs> And I'm seeing it more and more every day. I don't know about you, but I like staying on the solid rock of God's Word. Now, this morning we're going to be dealing with the altar of incense. And I, I want you, as, as we get into this, we're going to cover some things. And I want you to understand the succinctness of the kingdom and the layout of the, the tabernacle. A lot of people don't want to mess with the brazen altar. They ignore the menorah. They don't want to go to the table of showbread. They want to go directly to that altar of incense. And we're going to find out this morning, you do that, what's going to come in your life is called calamity. And how many of us have seen believers that have rejected all the other and went to that altar of incense and absolutely all hell has broken loose in their lives? They get a book on spiritual warfare and spiritual mapping. And so they try to come against regional spirits that what they're doing, they're in allegiance with. And you can't, you can't fight what you're in allegiance with. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's good preaching anyway. To pray against something, you've got to be against something. That means you can't be in allegiance or alliance with it. I don't know, that, that just makes sense to me. But I want us to look here in Exodus chapter 30, verses 1 through 6, and this is the instruction for building the altar of incense. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon, of shittim which shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horn thereof shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and the top thereof, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about it. What did we learn last week? Whenever you see a crown, it's talking about the ministry of Jesus. It's talking about the king of kings. And two gold rings shall thou make it uh, to have a crown thereof uh, on it, or of it, and of two corners thereof, upon the two sides of it shall thou make it, and thou shalt... Uh, be for a place for the staves to bear it withal, and thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, and thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony. Look, look where it's seated, just right on the other side 
in the Holy of Holies right up against that great veil that goes into the Holy of Holies. So it's right before the throne of God. How many know that when you pray, your prayers, the Bible says, are right before the throne of God? They're not showing up in his parking lot somewhere. How many know that's good to know? How many have felt like when we prayed, it showed up in this parking lot, some other parking lot, but it wasn't showing up before the throne of God? If you follow it the way that God tells us to do it in his word, your prayers are going to end up where they need to be. It says, and thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. Boy, you need to underline that in your Bible, where I will meet with thee. Now, there are various names in the word of God concerning the altar of incense. It's called the altar of incense, the incense altar, the altar of gold, which why do we find out last week gold represents holiness, so it's the altar of holiness, the golden altar, the golden altar which is before the throne. I like that one. Before the throne. In fact, we find in Revelations 8, 3 that it's there. That the, what, the, what they made in the tabernacle of Moses was a replica of the real deal in heaven. And that our prayers are represented in that incense. And it begins to appear before the throne of God. And a lot of times what you pray, that there's a hope involved. It's, it's what you see in your heart as you're praying that biblical hope. And the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us that that hope appears beyond the veil. It appears before the very throne of God. That as you're praying, God literally sees what you're praying about. He sees what you're hoping for in your heart. The whole altar which is by the oracle, the altar before the Lord, the altar of burning incense, and the altar of sweet incense before the Lord. How many times do we see before the Lord, before the Lord, before the Lord, before the Lord? I mean, no, God is trying to tell us something about our prayers, where he wants them. That's reassuring to me. That is reassuring to me. Now, Dake says there are 15 commands in these verses regarding the altar of incense. To make an altar to burn incense upon it. That shows you the purpose of what this is about is to represent prayers. It's not to, you can't do on that altar what you're supposed to do on the brazen altar. Does that make sense? It's because you've taken care of things at the brazen altar, you can come to this altar. It's made of shittim wood or out of what we discovered last week of incorruptible flesh, Messiah. To make it 24 inches square, the height there of four feet and two inches. To make four horns of the same and uh, the shape of the four corners. To overlay it with gold, the sides and the top and the horns. In other words, it has to be layered in holiness. Intercessory prayer is birthed out of holiness. That's going to... That's gonna... True prayer, true intercession is birthed out of personal holiness because you have done what you're supposed to do at the brazen altar. And if you can't, if you're trying to pray out of what you have not taken care of at the brazen altar, you know there are prayers that God does not hear. Prayers prayed out of sin, God will not hear. Prayers prayed out of the flesh, God will not hear. Those one videos on, on binding the strong man of America, you know if you have broken covenants, God won't hear your prayers. This, this is an altar of incense covered in holiness. As I respond in his holiness, it begins to open up prayers in my life. Make a crown of gold round about it. So it's, it represents the ministry of Jesus and some things he's supposed to do for us. Eight, to make four gold rings in the four corners and place it under the, the crown uh, for staves to carry it. Let me tell you something. Sometimes there's some labor. There's a carrying that goes on intercession. Has anybody ever labored in intercession? The Apostle Paul in Galatians says, I labor as a woman in travail for you until Christ be birthed in you again. That some people had come in and got them thinking their salvation was based upon circumcision instead of the cross. 
And Jesus and, and Paul said, I labor for you. I travail for you. I am I've I've got the staves through the the through the uh the altar of incense and I'm bearing it up. I'm allowing its load to be weighed on me. And if anybody's ever an intercessor, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes God will put a burden on you, and with what we've not realized, he's, he's calling you in your priesthood to pick up and to carry the altar of incense to get something done. And how long do you pray? You pray until the burden is lifted. Old-time Pentecostals used to call that praying through. You pray until you get a breakthrough. And I, I've known a lot of people just, you know, even within the faith movement or some other movements, you know, you just, you just confess it once and you go on. I want someone, if they're going to pray for me, I want, and when they feel that burden, I want them to pray until the burden's lifted. Because many times, if, if you understand intercessory prayer and God has you intercede for somebody, you're in a dangerous situation. And as they pray, God begins to change that situation. And once the danger passes, the burden lifts. You don't want to get halfway out of the situation, and then what lifts is the presence of God. You want them to pray through in that situation. And how many times have, have I heard reports of people that wake up in the middle of the night and pray for somebody, and that very hour they were on the road, and they were almost in, a, in an accident that took their lives. But right in that very situation, God moved, and, and the situation was averted, sometimes to their surprise and the surprise of someone who almost hit them. And we, we, need, to, we need to understand that's part of our priesthood, that there's some things I'm going to have to put the staff's up and I'm going to have to lift and I'm going to have to carry that thing to get it before the throne of God. Let that sink in. How many know that's more than name it and claim it? That's praying it through. Nine. Make two staffs to shoot them and overlay them with gold. Put the altar before the veil in the holy place opposite of the ark of the, of the testimony on the other side of the veil. Aaron shall burn sweet incense upon it every morning and every evening when he prepares the lamps. How I many know there are really two times of uh, windows of, of sweet opportunity that your prayers are, I don't know about you, it's like in the morning if, when you wake up, if you pray before you start the day, there's like a window of opportunity there. It's setting things in order. In the evening as the sun is setting, if you will pray, there's a window there. And that window was established with Aaron and two times a day he would put incense on that. That was, show, that was teaching us that there are windows. And how, what's, the, what's the devil's lie? I'm too tired tonight to pray. Anybody ever hear that one? Or the other one I'm a real sucker for. I got too many things to do this morning to pray. I need to go rush and start doing these things. Even Martin Luther, as messed up as he was on some areas, and he was, he rejected the Sabbath when it was presented to him. And that actually caused, if, if he would have embraced the Sabbath, there, there was a place in his ministry where the Catholic Church was completely falling apart and giving in to the Protestant movement. And, there were, and all these bishops and everything came in, and they were about ready to renounce Rome completely. And this one bishop told the Pope, don't worry, I got him. And so as they were, because they, they like sola scriptoris, only scripture, only scripture not the traditions of Rome. And this one guy got up and said, you're a hypocrite. Martin Luther, you're a liar. And Martin Luther says, what do you mean a lie? He says, you know that Rome changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And you say only scripture, but you're still obeying the commands of the Pope. You're a hypocrite. And that whole thing imploded on him. But what he did say that was right he said, I have too many things to do not to pray. He got half of it right, didn't he? Don't you kind of wish he'd have prayed through on the Sabbath instead of him just kicking into Roman priesthood, you know? Because that's what he was trained to be. He was trained to be a Roman priest. 
Do you know that's what he was when he nailed the 95 theses on the wall? He was a priest of the Church of Rome when he did that. And he just protested those 95 things. I think there should have been at least 96. The Sabbath should have been one of them. But guys, we have windows of opportunity when we pray in the morning and in the evening. Now, yes, the Bible says pray without ceasing, but these are talking about specific times to release intercessory prayer. We found out if you pray in the morning and take authority over the day and intercede, that the whole day goes better. In the evening, why is it so important to pray in the evening? Darkness is starting to fall. What functions in darkness? You better take authority for the darkness comes. As darkness sets in, you better start interceding. 13, the incense shall be burned perpetually like a lamp day and night. That's where when the apostle Paul says pray without ceasing, he was actually looking at how that flame was constantly always on the altar. Do not offer strange incense or burnt offerings or meat offerings upon it. Do not pour any drink offering upon it. Don't bring strange things. How many know there's a lot of strange teachings going on today? All these crazy things about t- types of prayer and all this. You better make sure that it's not strange to bring it to that altar. Aaron shall make atonement upon its four horns once a year, the blood of the sin offering. So the same, when he, when he would do the, on the day of atonement, when he would do the sin offering, not only would he go into the holy of holies and place the blood of the lamb on the right side. He he was never allowed to sprinkle it on the left side. It was always the right side of the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Where's Jesus' seat? The right side. But he also took blood and put it on the four horns. Why is that important? The blood needs to cover what we pray. If it isn't in line with the blood of Jesus, we ought not pray it. Now, I'm just kind of bringing some basics. How many know sometimes it's good just to get to the basics? We need to have intercessory prayer done right. Insights regarding the uh, altar of incense and prayer. The burning incense represents the prayer of the saints we find in the book of Revelation, but it also represents the intercessory ministry of Jesus. Hebrews 7 25 says, Wherefore he is able to save them to the utmost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. One of the reasons why that is burning day and night and never ceasing, it represents the king, because it's setting on a crown. It represents the king who is constantly praying for us. And I don't know about you, but I want to make the ministry of Jesus a little bit easier. I want him to not have to pray, oh, Father, overlook Mike, overlook Mike, overlook Mike. I would rather him say, Lord, empower what I'm telling Mike to do. Lord, empower what I'm telling Mike to do. There, there, there has to be a, some grown-up prayer going on. But what I have also discovered is when we enter into intercessory prayer, if I'm his body, I have the privilege of allowing him to pray through me. Do you ever think we could frustrate the ministry of Jesus if God's moving on us to pray and we won't? See, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm trying to bring intercessory prayer back in line with the word, back in line with the tabernacle. When God moves on you, there's a reason he's moving on you. If you'll open yourself up to it, to pray for others, to intercede for others. To allow Jesus to begin. Yeah, I'm going to share this. One of the the things I heard a minister years ago, and and he was struggling with sickness and disease in his body. You know what he began to do? He began to pray for the sick. He started said, you know, I'm going to start praying for the sick all the time. Every time I see somebody sick, I'm going to go hands and I'm going to lay hands on them. You know why? If healing anointing would flow through his flesh, it would affect him as he was ministering. Guys, I learn more while I'm in this pulpit than I am in my study because when the anointing is on me, I start seeing pieces to the puzzle that I've never seen before, and I learn as I'm teaching you guys. I get more out of it than you guys do. There's been times I've had to go back and listen to a sermon so that I could readjust all my notes for what God was showing me as I was teaching. That as I intercede, 
I am loosing an anointing for heaven to intercede for me as I intercede for others. How many would it be comforting to know that others were praying for you? Well, then it's time to start praying for others. It had, life has to be more about more than me, myself, and I. And there, there's there's a transition with kids. And I've seen this when they're when they're really itty bitty. It's just about them. If they're hungry, they cry. If they need change, they cry. They don't care what mom and dad are doing. They don't care if it's 2 o'clock in the morning. But then as they get a little bit older, they become aware of others, and it kind of flops the opposite, don't it? They're, they're worried about Jimmy because Jimmy didn't get something if they went to Walmart, or, or you, you, have, you have siblings, and one gets something, they want to make sure the other one has something. And there's that, there's that age of innocence. But then the world gets hold, and then it comes back to me, myself, and I. And the only way that you can revert back to the other is by the cross. To go back to the purity before what the Apostle Paul said, sin took hold and I died. When sin took hold and I died, then it's all about me, myself, and I again. Intercession is not only praying things in my life and, and over the areas of influence that God has given me, but those that God has brought into my life. And many times if we open ourselves up, God will have us pray for people we don't even know. We just know something's wrong. And you pray as, as God does that. And I, there, there, have been, there have been times that I have prayed for things and just had such a burden on my life. And I prayed through. I didn't have, you know, a lot of times I'll just pray in the spirit or something. And, this, and this thing, all, sometimes, oh, oh, God, this, whatever this is, just deal with it, please. I, I don't know what it is, but I just sense there's something going on. And then a couple of years down the road, I'll, I'll, find, I'll talk to somebody that about that same time I found out they were going through something that was very dangerous. And it's, it's God just saying, you know what? You did good, Mike. You, you prayed for them when you didn't even know them. But if they're a part of the body, we're connected. That's part of the, the ministry of our priesthood is praying what we could do if we realized that our prayers were before the throne of God. Now, we need to understand the succinctness. Your prayer life never really begins to develop, your real prayer life, the, the intercessory prayer life, until several things happen. You have entered into the ministry of the brazen altar and offered the proper amount of sacrifices there. Why is that? God's not going to tell you to pray for somebody else when you've got a whole load that you need to deal with yourself. Because there's a flip side, there's a spirit that gets you to want to pray for everybody else because everybody else is in error and all this and that and the other, and you never apply the word to you. It's always being applied to somebody else. How many times I have preached, this, preached my little heart out, and then somebody after service comes up and says, boy, I wish Jimmy would have been here. Well, maybe the Holy Ghost didn't have Jimmy here because he wasn't the one that really needed it. And it was the, the attitude of never dealing with the brazen altar, you deflect it over to somebody else, and somebody else needs to bring their stuff to that brazen altar, but you have never been there. When you first come, when I, when I found out with new believers when they first get saved, their basic prayers are, Lord, bless the pastor, bless Jimmy, bless this. And then the whole time God is beginning to show them what they need to bring to that brazen altar to clean up their lives. And you find out somebody gets saved, they get happy. You know, ah, then about three weeks later, you know, I gave up drugs. Well, you were still taking them for the last three weeks, <laughs> you know. Then I gave up alcohol or I gave up this or I gave up that. What's the Holy Spirit doing? Now that he's moved in, he's saying, I'm going to rearrange the furniture just a little bit, and I'm going to tell you all the stuff that you need to get rid of. And he starts having them clean house, and he starts having them forgive you know, if you've ever been around, a, ever been around where uh, men in their twenties start getting saved, it's kind of cool to watch. Or, or girls in their in their eighteen, twenty, twenty one, trying to get saved. You know, and they get saved, and and just watch this this the tenderness of their hearts. I I forgive Jenny, and I forgive this one, and I forgive that one, and I know somebody didn't do this, and they're, they're just constantly they're they're looking there, they're just bringing loads of stuff to the brazen altar. 
Yet much of our theology today tells us never to use that thing. But you got to do that before you can get to the other. Until you finish your outer court ministry to a great degree, you're never going to be able to move into an inner court ministry. And what everybody wants to do is say a 30-second prayer in church then go into the inner court. You can't do that. God's not going to let you. The devil's pulled wool over your eyes and you're out wandering around out in the outer court thinking, boy, I've been here with the good stuff now. And everybody comes up with crazy stuff. The second one, God has promoted you into the holy place where you're eating of the table of showbread. In other words, as I commune with him and his word, I'm beginning to establish kingdom order in my life. You know, when you start getting kingdom order in your life, you can pray effectively. You start finding out who you are in Christ, that who Christ is in you. Is this making sense? You begin to find out your authority in Christ. And so it begins to set things in order. And, you're ser- and you have served uh, the, and under the light of the menorah. You, when, when every morning and every evening, the high priest would go in there. He would light the incense, and he would make sure there was plenty of oil in the lamp. You see, it's what you do in that place that brings the oil. How many of us have seen people in their lives, the, the flame of God's presence, the oil, has dwindled down to nothing in their lives? They used to be really anointed. Used to have a lot of wisdom from the Word of God. I mean, there are guys that I respect that, that have really spoken to my life, and all of a sudden, they, 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 they didn't do the ministry on, on, in the holy place the way that they should have, and they never serviced the menorah. They were never interceding. They, they quit eating from the bread of that table, and the next thing you know is just rehashing old sermons. Rehashing and rehashing and rehashing. And I mean, know sometimes you can hash that thing so long you can't even find the eggs that were in it anymore. You can't find the potatoes that was in it anymore. You kind of wonder, what, what in the world's in all this rehashing? You know, goulash is nice, but not when you serve up the same goulash the fifth, five hundredth time. Well, what's happening? They've not serviced, they've not done the service in that inner court the way that they're supposed to. God can never give you revelation that if you begin implementing it, more doesn't come. Does that make sense? As, as God is showing you revelation, you're, because you're under, the, under his light, you're receiving the bread of what Jesus has done, the bread of the word, and it's starting to be real to you. He shows it to you. You implement it, and when you successfully implement it, that's part of servicing in that area, that you're servicing the menorah to bring more oil, and God always shows you more. And one of the things that really, if I, if I quit getting revelation, it alarms me. If, if I don't open up the word and it doesn't start speaking to me, I know, okay, God, what did I miss? Where, where, where did I not do what you showed me? Because God's saying, you know what? Well, there was a prophet of God years ago. And uh, God showed him this long table of all the all the food of the kingdom. And they had eaten, and they had eaten, and they had eaten, and they had eaten, and they had eaten. And they got so big they couldn't get up from the table because they never went out to work in the fields. You know, if you've ever been in a farm, you can eat big breakfasts because you go and you do big stuff, you burn it off, you, you come and you, you eat a big dinner. What I have found... Big breakfast, big lunch, big dinner, no big work. You need a big belt. I don't do farm work. But how many know we're called to work in his field? And as we receive that revelation and we're implementing it, that means we're out working in his field. We're doing the things that God has shown us in his word as a part of our ministry to him. And if we do that, God can give us more. And this prophet was looking at this, and God says, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And he watched the hand of God clear that table completely off bare. And says, I'll not give them another thing until they start doing what I've already told them. 
I'll not give them another thing. And how many denominations have we seen that stopped someplace in their walk? They, they had revelation knowledge and God was doing things and then they just got to where they stopped. And now everything is about what God showed them in 1904. Some 1804. Some can't get past Calvin. I mean, no, that was a little bit before 1804. They can't, they can't get past. Why? There's no implementation. Somewhere along the line, they stalled out. They quit working. And therefore, God says, you can't eat. Now, that's not anywhere in my notes, but it's, it's, it's the truth of the matter. If you, working spiritually is like in a gym. One of the things in a gym is they say, if you don't use it, you lose it. Now, I used to have a lot of muscle. Used to. It's hiding. Why? I didn't use it. I got doing ministry and stayed a lot of time behind a desk. There were times in my life by using muscles, you develop muscle mass. You quit using it, you begin losing it. It's the same way spiritually. If God shows you something, you have to consistently use it in his service, and as you do, it grows stronger, and then he can show you something else, and he can show you something else. But it all comes when, when, when you get rid of the, the flesh in the outer court, you can come in and begin learning the real things of the kingdom of God, the deeper things. Am I making sense this morning or am I just kind of speaking to the air? Is, this, is, this, is it ringing true, hitting the bell, pushing the button? <laughs> Guys, I want us to walk in the best of God. I want us to do this correctly. Guys, until then, the task of the Holy Spirit is always going to be to take us back to the brazen altar. And right now, across the body of Christ... There needs to be a lot of repenting, a lot of crying and seeking God. Because when the body really opens up its eyes, we have strayed so far from the tabernacle, we can't even see it anymore. It's way off down yonder around a hill, around a holler somewhere, because we have so, so strayed off the left field that we're not even in the game anymore. And yet we're calling it church. God is calling us back to his ways. Now, True intercession, guys, is birth by learning to function and to receive through the ministries of the menorah and the table of showbread. The priests would burn incense as they ate of the showbread in the light of the menorah. That's where true intercession, as God shows you, as God's working on you, it begins to do some things in your life. That's when you start praying and you actually start seeing results. Because if, you, if your prayers are birthed out of the light of the menorah and that table of showbread, it is always going to produce results. I don't know about you, but I'm after results. I'm not after activity. If I pray, I want something to happen. I just don't want to bend God's ear for the sake of bending God's ear. I want something to happen. Now, the question I need to, I think all of us need to ask, why are some destroyed in spiritual warfare and intercessory prayer? Do you know that's happened? They've offered strange fire, but we need to define what strange fire is. But I, I've noticed, I've known people that, uh, in fact, in a town not too far from here, there was a church, for, I've been told, that started doing spiritual mapping, and they started coming against the uh, spirit of poverty in that area without dealing with the outer court and getting into the inner court, that church isn't here anymore. All absolute hell broke loose in that church. And I have heard that, and I have dealt with ministries that have done things. They begin, well, we're going to do spiritual warfare. I've seen too many people do spiritual warfare, and they're the ones that got beat up. Why? You cannot fight against what you're still in alliance with. That's why that outer court is so important. If I burn up my allegiance to Baal Haman, the pagan god of prosperity, which our entire Babylonian system is based on, every Freemason has insisted on it being developed that way, I've got to break free of that before I can start praying against it. 
if I don't, it'll rise up and kill me. Now, I want us to look here in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, because this is dealing with the altar of incense. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took his censer and put fire in it, put, fire, uh, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which the Lord had not commanded him. So fire went out from before the Lord and devoured him, and, he, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. So here he has two sons. Now, you got to understand, this was in the very first time they ever lit the altar, guys. If you go back and you read the story, Moses is teaching them, and they just come right out of college, if you will, that Moses taught Aaron and, and taught all them, this is exactly what you got to need to do. And so they, they dedicated the altar. They dedicated the tabernacle. It was finally all put together, and all of them are partying. And how many know, you know, there, there was wine flowing, and, and, and wine wasn't bad enough, but these two boys mixed strong drink. You know, in the wine, they had to make them a cooler or whatever the thing is where they, you know, they, they put strong drink in it, and they got drunk. And it was too much of a bother to go out and get fire off the brazen altar. They had to go and get another fire. Don't know if it was closer, don't know what they were thinking, they were drunk. But with the moment they lit it, that incense and brought that in and put it on the altar of incense, a fire of God consumed them. Why is this so important? The fire, the only fire that is allowed on the altar of incense is from the things that the Holy Spirit has burned up in your life of the flesh. If you try to bring in another fire, it will destroy you. Guys, we're seeing that in the charismatic movement today, that they're bringing in other fire because it brings in money. They're bringing in other fire that never had the sacrifice of the flesh, that never was crucified with Christ. They're bringing in any fire that can stir up the people to bring in money, to build crowds, or whatever. And what, what is going to happen is that since they brought in strange fire into the altar of God, it will consume them. I have been in services where I've had to plead the blood of Jesus between me and what was going on in that service because there was an anointing there, but it was not of God. Everybody was getting excited and I was getting concerned. This isn't God. It can sure get the flesh excited. I mean, that it, it, excitement from the fire of God is beyond just fleshliness. How many of us have gotten excited in the flesh about doing something and then go try to do it in the flesh and it falls apart? Seems about this time every year, everybody's gonna, gonna get in shape. And so right now, every gym in the nation is being swamped with people going there, I'm gonna exercise 15 times a week and I'm gonna do this, that, and the other. How many of that fire kind of peters out after a while? They go and they work out, then they stop through McDonald's to get a double quarter pounder with cheese. Before they go through, they get a, well, a half pounder as they go home, sometimes coming and going, or they stop at Krispy Kremes on the way there. Then they You have this fire, you have this determination, but it's a strange fire. It's all just in the flesh, and it will quickly peter out. And if, that's if you're lucky because sometimes it will raise up and destroy you. But when there's a fire from God of what he has done in your life and the Holy Spirit has burned something up, it sets a determination in the heart of man that you press through the hard times with that fire. The true fire of God, you will press through. You see, that fire the devil doesn't want to see in your eyes when you're doing spiritual warfare. It's when it's a holy fire birthed out of the brazen altar that you have brought and you have brought and it has set a fire your prayers. 
incense represents your prayer life. The fire from the brazen altar is what sets your prayer life ablaze with the power of God that releases true prayer in your life. And when you have that, God begins to move. Guys, in my own life, I can tell when I'm just praying and I'm just praying. Mary can tell you this. Okay, let's say our prayer is blah, 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 blah. There ain't no fire. But we can tell when our prayer comes in line and starts catching fire off the brazen altar. An authority takes a hold. An anointing takes a hold. A determination takes a hold that heaven moves and scares hell. That comes off of that altar when it's holy fire placed upon a holy altar. Why do you think the devil hates preaching a crucified life so much? Why do you think the devil just wants everything's good, everything's grace? Just abandon that brazen altar so that you have no fire to bring upon the altar. Because until you get a holy fire in that, in that altar, you're not really interceding. You're just beating the wind. You're just doing religion. And if you insist on it enough that you actually get something burning on that altar that isn't of God... Satan already knows God's word is true and that God himself will raise up to put a stop to it. So a lot of people that were doing things out of the flesh that should have been crucified, there have been a lot of churches, guys, a lot of congregations, a lot of ministries over the years that have shut down that the devil did not shut them down. God did. Because what they were doing, they were doing out of the flesh, and it would have replicated and replicated and replicated. And God was not considered holy. The number one thing you never, ever, ever want to do in the body of Christ is get up and saying, I did it my way. Then God's not holy. You've made yourself above God. I don't want strange fire upon the altar. I want, to, I want to get this thing in line with the cross. I want to get it in line with the tabernacle. Because I want real fire in my life. I want real intercessory prayer in my life that Jesus can be a part of. And there is a kingliness to that prayer life that begins to flow with that. I've been preaching so hard. Yeah, that is my last one. Everybody said that's his last one. True intercession and spiritual warfare come from what you have offered at the brazen altar. Do you know when a, uh, we, we have seen people come off of drugs that start ministering to, to drug addicts? You know when they can do that and do that safely and get success is when their drug habit has been completely burned up on the brazen altar. If it's not, it will resurrect itself and they'll end up being the ones on drugs. How many have seen that? we got to do our ministry in the outer court and get it significantly done. And to keep that fire, you see, that fire was supposed to be a perpetual fire too. There's always something in your life that needs to be burned up. There's always something in your life that God needs to give you wisdom from that menorah from. There's always something in your life that you need to eat from that table of showbread. And there's always something in your life that you need to pray about or pray for others. And as this thing works in concert with one another the way that God wants it done, we're going to start seeing results. And I want to see kingdom results in my life. I want to see kingdom results in the, in the, the ministry of biblical life. I want to see kingdom results replicated in the lives of all those that watch on the Internet. I want to see that done in their lives, and this year is the year to do it. We have an open door. God is saying those that are set on deception... I'm going to let them be deceived beyond deception. I'm going to pour out a spirit of delusion upon them. But those who seek my face that want to be right, I'm going to bless them. I'm going to empower them. Those that line up with the cross, that line up with God's commandments, that line up with the spirit of God, God's going to do things in unprecedented ways. I'm already starting to see it. I'm starting to hear reports of it. I'm starting to see it in my own life. 
and I want it in everybody's lives. But it's got to flow within the pattern. Can everybody see that this morning? I want you to have a real intercessory prayer life because you did it according to God's, according to God's instructions to get real results. When you are done with intercessory prayer, not only should you see that thing change, but there should be a blessing for you for being faithful in that service. Well, Father God, I thank you for the word this morning. Father, I thank you that your word will not return to you void, but will accomplish whereunto you have sent it. And Father, let us get things right. Let us bring them in line with your word. Let us bring them in line with the cross. And let us bring them in line with our priesthood as servants of God under that new covenant that lines everything according to the priesthood of Melchizedek. Father, give us an anointing. Give us wisdom. Give us a determination like we have never had before that we can see those things brought in order. Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name.